The first trend I want to talk about is the, uh, is the emergence uh, of a post-Western world. And just to, just to go back a, a second, I do want to talk about those trends because we can't uh, analyze foreign policy. We can't talk about the role of Brazil in a vacuum. It's really important to say, well, what is Brazil's role? And we can talk about that, but at the same time, we have to understand in, in what kind of world do we live in today and what should Brazil's role be in that world. So the, the first trends will be kind of to set the stage for us to understand um, what kind of world we live in and what kind of world we will be living in uh, in maybe 50 years from now and what Brazil's and India's role should be in that, in that kind of world. And before I say post-Western world, I'd like to highlight the fact that we have for the past 500 years lived in a very much in a, in a Western world. And most people aren't really aware of the fact of how much the West really influenced everything in the world, not even, even non-Western cultures. The guy on the left here is, is Columbus, uh, who f roughly 500 years ago um, went out to look for India and, and hit the uh, Western Hemisphere. And I think that move uh, represents um, the superiority, the military and technical superiority of, of Western civilization, because that was the moment when um, the Western countries set out to occupy uh, large parts, uh, parts of the globe. And this 1492 is what uh, people usually refer to as the beginning, uh, beginning of modernity as well. Um, so for the, for the next century or two, countries like France, the UK, um, the Netherlands, went to, went to all these places and actually ended up occupying most of the planet. So, uh, for example, 200 years after that, uh, Western powers occupied, uh, or occupied basically everybody who lived on the planet. And that wasn't only militarily, but Western ideas and values have, have had a, a huge influence on, on the way everybody thinks. For example, <clears throat> we look at the nation state, which is a Western idea. So the whole world nowadays organizes itself as nations. And that's a, that's a, a Western idea. We have um, even, even African countries are Western creations, right? The West came to Africa and, and, and cut the continent to pieces, and those are today uh, the, the countries. The way we measure time, for example, is a Western idea as well. So even in, in China nowadays, we are in, in 2009. So um, even uh, places all over the world, the, the West supposedly discovered places in, in faraway regions and named them Mount Everest, Victoria Falls. So we have this, this really this um, intense influence. And also one, one other thing, all kinds of um, political and, um, and economic philosophies that exist today in the world are all Western. So we have communism, fascism, democracy, um, all kinds of ways to organize that you can think of are all, all Western ideas. Um, and uh, one interesting thing, I think, is that Western people often think that that's because of uh, the superiority of uh, Western values. And that, I think, is, is obviously not the case, but this happened and uh, the West was able to impose itself on the world because of uh, technical and military superiority. So, and and it, was, it was not done with soft power. It wasn't done because it was more attractive, but because the, the West had the hard power to impose itself on, on different cultures and different peoples. Now, um, so we, we have the Western world. And now this guy, does anybody know this guy? No? Okay, I, I don't know this guy either, but uh, he's, um, it's a former Lehman employee, actually. Um, and I, I took this picture because I, during the, the crisis, I, I lived in New York for a while, and this guy has just packed up his stuff, and Lehman Brothers has just closed. And New York was full of those people for, for a while. It was really amazing. You saw those depressed bankers, uh, you know, in, in, in suits, <coughs> carrying out all their, their files. And Lehman Brothers was actually the, the beginning of the, the financial crisis, and there's a lot of people today who say that in 200 years from now, historians or political scientists will mark that year as the end of a 500-year reign of, of, of Western dominance. And I, obviously that's a, that's a big statement, and we, we, we can't tell for sure, but the, the crisis that we've, <clears throat> that we've lived today that hasn't really hit Brazil at all in comparison to America and that hasn't had India or China really is the first time that the, we have a financial crisis that, uh, that originated in a rich country that had a terrible impact in, 
uh, America and in, in Europe, and that didn't really hit the, the, uh, the non-Western regions of the world. Um, so that's why more and more people say that, the, that this crisis could be uh, regarded kind of as a beginning of, of the emergence of a post-Western world. We have different poles of power that are not located in the, in the traditional Western, the Western regions. So that's why when I talk about a power shift, I really want to talk about a, a hard power shift. And I, I do want to specifically um, lay emphasis on the economic aspect of, of hard power. Because here, when you look at military expenditure, you can see that 41% um, of all global military expenditure is still um, by, by the, uh, done by the Americans. So America has actually more military power than China, France, the UK, Russia, and maybe another five countries combined. So there's no question that we still, in a military sense, live in a totally Western American world which is dominated. But economic power is more important because in 2050, uh, those countries will have the economic means to purchase m uh, an army that is much larger uh, than that of, of, that the Americans have right now. So uh, this is a much better indicator of future power. The economic power today <clears throat> is a very good indicator of military power in the future. And I think those numbers are, are really amazing. You, you have the BRICS, every, the BRICS here are probably very known to everybody, right? Okay. So you have 16% of global GDP, and only seven years later it goes up to 23, and for the first time it's bigger than American GDP. So in theory, if, if all uh, uh, those four countries, I mean, they're very different countries, but if, if the BRIC countries, you take them together, they have a larger GDP than, than America. And that's really historic. And, and in 2050, that's a study here by, by Goldman Sachs that everybody probably knows. It's called the Dreaming with the BRICS. Um, and the Goldman Sachs actually coined the term BRICS. And it, it was initially an investment uh, category, but... Uh, this study that they've produced here is a, is a forecast uh, over uh, using uh, past figures to forecast economic growth for the next four decades. And that's the list that is now, at least in the circles of political science, widely accepted. So you have China as the largest economy in the world. You have the U.S. second, which are still dominating. And then you have India, Japan, and Brazil. So of the traditional other powers, there, there's, no, there's no Germany, there's no uh, United Kingdom or France in there. So you have a, a really a different, um, a different situation than you have today. And some of the figures that we read in the newspaper today are, are indicative. For example, China is now the biggest uh, car market in the world. Um, and uh, over 75% of the growth after the crisis has been generated only by China and, and India. So there's been no growth in the traditional powerful centers of, of the world. So. That's actually the, the, the first trend um, of the three that I'll talk about. The second trend is the emergence of, of global challenges. So just to, to summarize, we have the first trend, we have a shift of power from traditional uh, powerful countries to, to new countries, to emerging countries like China, India, and Brazil. And the second is a, is, is a new type of problem that cannot be solved by the usual problem-solving strategy. The usual problem-solving uh, problem strategy was to get a small amount of countries, usually seven, in, uh, in the, in seven countries together, um, which then formed the G7 later on to fix global finance, to fix, try to fix poverty. And, and, and it actually now turns out that those problems are problems that, that can't be solved like that anymore. And I think climate change is a, is a very obvious example. No country in the world can close its borders and say, we don't, we don't care about climate change, right? Because it, uh, the cause and effect is totally displaced, so there's no, there's no tie to that. You could, if somebody pollutes in China, somebody in Brazil feels the effect of that. Um, and at the same time, if, we, if you think now about Brazil's role, we could say that's really a great opportunity for, for Brazil to assume leadership, right? Because... The, the whole point of, of this is to, to think about how can Brazil increase its leadership, how can Brazil increase its power. And suddenly you have problems that require the uh, participation of a lot of countries. So Brazil, if you, if you think about it, it says, well, that's, that's wonderful. We can assume leadership. 